November 11, 1994, and it's at his home at 9 Fourth Road, Great Neck, New York. And I am the interviewer. I'm Carol Pohl, and I teach sociology at FIT. It's part of the Oral History Project for the 50th anniversary. Okay, David. Uh, I'd like to start and do tracing back your years at FIT. Could you tell me the number of years and what year you began at FIT? I began in the Continuing Education Division in 1956 uh, with one class. I had uh, just transferred from the Board of Education where I had been a high school teacher for 12 years. And at that time, it was still possible to transfer to the Fashion Institute of Technology. Uh, within a few years after that, uh, FIT severed itself from uh, the Board of Education, although it still remained its local sponsor. But uh, 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 those of us who had come from the Board of Education, there were several faculty members who had come from the Board, uh, were given the choice of giving up their tenure uh, which they had at the Board of Ed, and uh, getting it again at FIT, or going back to the Board of Ed. And several people who were on the faculty at FIT chose to go back to the Board of Ed. Uh, that must have been about 1960. And uh, others of us took the chance and remained. Uh, I was one of them, of course. Uh, in 1956, I, uh, uh, I taught that one class in continuing ed and was observed by Bill Leader, who was then the head of the science department and dean of continuing ed. And uh, uh, Bill wrote me a glowing report. And then uh, I had the opportunity to interview for a job in the day session. Uh, uh, and. Uh, I did, and uh, I, I got the second job in the English department. There was already one uh, full-time person in the English department, aside from the chairman, and I became the second teacher. Uh, the fact is I almost left in two weeks because I discovered that the, the chairman of the department who had gotten his job because he had played the saxophone in a, a fundraising uh, affair upstate. He had been an English teacher at the uh, Central Needle Trades High School uh, and then was given the reward uh, of, of, of being made chairman of the English department, was a, a totally corrupt, uh, ignorant, or, although cunning man. And when I arrived, I realized uh, very rapidly that it would be murderous for me to work with him. And uh, I determined to go back. Fortunately, my wife objected to my leaving there and said that over her dead body would I leave, and I did not. And um, I remained, but it, it was a very, very difficult time for me because I had given up tenure. But I became very active in a number of areas at FIT. First, uh, the condition for my coming was that I would become faculty advisor to the newspaper, which was then called the Fashion Collegiate. And uh, I was told I would have a staff, and of course it turned out it was just an apparel class, and I ended up writing the whole newspaper myself. And um, it was, uh, it was quite, a, quite a terrible adjustment. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the chairman of the department uh, was, uh, was a terribly uh, authoritarian and, uh, and, and abusive man. And uh, the entire liberal arts division was confined to one office in the C building. And the English office was a book closet in, in the C building. Uh, no, no, excuse me, not the C building. I mean in Central Needle Trades High School. The C building did not exist. There was no campus yet. This was on 24th Street. I do not mean the C building. The C building came several years later. This was the upper two floors of Central Needle Trades High School was the was FIT. Uh, and uh, 
we had a kind of a relationship with uh, Nat Brown, who was the principal of the Central Middle Trades High School, which later became Fashion Industries High School. And, uh, but we were all confined to one small room, the entire liberal arts uh, staff, and the entire FIT teaching faculty must have been, what, I, I'm not sure exactly, 20, 24 people. The, the entire student body was 300, uh, 300 students. And uh, it was quite a difficult adjustment. This was already 1957. Uh, and of course, FIT had been in business since 44, part of the State University of New York and all of that. Uh, what happened was that uh, a faculty association was mandated by the state a few years later and uh, I was elected the first president of the faculty association at FIT. And uh, committees were formulated and, uh, and, uh, that were, uh, we got into action as a faculty, uh, but there were still many, many abuses uh, that were being visited on faculty. Uh, my chairman, for instance, kept a secret file. He realized that uh, uh, I was already uh, uh, challenging him in terms of his educational uh, ability and his uh, uh, his ethics and his uh, his philosophy. And I proposed a literature course. We did not even have a literature course. We simply had composition and speech, which were required courses. And I. And uh, he objected to that. He said the only uh, uh, literature we ought to do in English was to teach famous quotes of people to the apparel kids so that they could use them in ads. And I said, this didn't sound like a college. And he started keeping a secret file, which he exposed to me, uh, about uh, uh, my not being cooperative, my uh, uh, challenging him, and of course, uh, the whole issue of tenure began to loom as a dark uh, 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 fear uh, for me and uh, because the tenure and promotion committee consisted only of uh, deans uh, and uh, chairs of uh, departments who were not elected then of course but were picked by administration and their sessions were always Mr. president then Bethel, Larry Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L, who uh, was the first president, and of course, uh, who interviewed me before I got the full-time job. And there was a dean, a woman who had come from the high school, who was quite splendid. Her speech was not very good, and, uh, but she was very bright, and she was very good. Rosalind Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R. And uh, she was a crackerjack. I must say, she was one of the people who came from the high school and was the dean of the college, Rosalind Snyder, whom I felt great respect for, even though, you know, it was, uh, her speech was really poor, but she was very bright, and she, was, she, she knew the score about what was going on. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I went to her to intervene, and she said she could do nothing about uh, my chairman, Ernest Fleischer. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I had a terrible time. And so in 60, by 65, um, at which time I had been the vice president of the AAUP unit at uh, uh, FIT, I realized What's as AAUP? The American Association of University Professors. Uh, we had a, uh, a unit, and I was vice president of it, and uh, somebody named Irving Hauptmann, who was in the science department, who recently died, uh, was president of it. And we realized that many, many abuses were uh, going on at the uh, FIT. For instance, Ernie Fleisch would walk around pinching uh, women in the elevators, their breasts, their, their rears, every, every, and he was getting away with it. He was abusive. He was, he was a horror. And uh, uh, 
we, we felt we had to do something, and the only way it occurred to some of us was to get a union. So in fifth in 65, three of us ran around getting uh, collective bargaining cards. Who was that? It was Judy Parkus, Erwin Kahn, and Dave Zeiger. Three of us. Judy Parkus, Erwin Kahn, and I ran around getting collective bargaining cards. Now, uh, some of the powers uh, there saw what was happening and were very unhappy, but we did have a support, the support of some of the labor people on the Board of Trustees, Louis Stolberg, uh, uh, and uh, who was the president of the IOGWU? Uh, yeah. David Dubinsky? Uh, Dubinsky, right. And, uh, you know, they... What was Stolberg's union? Uh, Stolberg had been uh, in some other... Uh, which union was he? I, I forget. But he was one of the labor people. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they made it clear that we ought not uh, uh, to be stopped. And, uh, uh, and it, it was very, very touch and go because I was then up for promotion and there was, you know, and I realized I was antagonizing a lot of very important people. And uh, as a matter of fact, Shirley Goodman, who uh, was then, in, you know, one of the really important people, you know, Shirley Goodman, who had died uh, a few years ago, uh, she began to respect me for what I was, but she stopped talking to me, and, uh, you know, it was very, and she was the power. You know. What was her official title? Secretary of the college, and she was like, Secretary of the Communist Party, I mean, you know, she was like, she was really, you know, Bethel and everyone, you know, she was really the power, and a very bright, very capable woman. I, I had some run-ins with her, but she was really one of the people who built that college. And, you know, in later years, we developed a, a good respect for each other, and, and even we got to like one another. And uh, uh, it, it was very uh, moving for me when she died. And, uh, and there was Gladys Marcus, who was the, you know, who, who, who was the uh, uh, dean. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dean of when, Liberal Arts. Dean of Liberal Arts. As a matter of fact, I, I, I ran against her. They ad, I was asked to by several people who didn't like what Gladys was doing, although I think she was wonderful. And I ran against Gladys, and Gladys won, thank God. I think I would not have survived. Ran for what? Dean, Dean of the college. The when the election condition? finally came up, I'm mixing them. This was after the union was in. Okay. And we, ran, we had election for... Dean, and I was asked to run against Gladys Marcus, and I did, and I was so glad that Gladys won, because I don't think I could have done one half of what Gladys did. She was really that capable, and so devoted, and so bright. And anyway, uh, what happened with the union is, of course, uh, you know, we, we brought the union in, and uh, uh, but before I did, I remember approaching Lou Stoller and saying, Lou, it's time for you to join the union. And he said, yes, Dave, I guess it is. I said, we need you. And Lou joined the union, Lou Stoller, and of course became what he is now. And as uh, soon as the union was r recognized, and this is the picture, you know, of the first contract signing, the T&P committee, for the first time, opened the uh, uh, the ranks of the uh, tenure and promotion committee to faculty. It had been a secret enterprise in camera for administrators and chair people, and two faculty were elected for the first time. I was one of them. The other was Sid Buckman. Sid Buckman, I don't know if you know Sid, but he, from management, he's now also an adjunct. And, uh, he's the father of the Buck of the Buckman, who's head of the uh, AC. Uh, what's his name? Jeff. Yeah. Jeff. Jeff Buckman. Sid Buckman uh, is his father, and Sid was in the management department. 
and Sid and I were the first two uh, faculty people on the uh, tenure and promotion committee. And, and, and we insisted it be open, you know, that it's the minutes and all be open to the faculty. So there I was on the tenure and promotion committee. I was the first president of the faculty association, and and uh, and things began to get better at FIT because we we set up a lot of committees, and we you know, and uh, and I of course uh, after I got tenure, and I got the tenure because a lot of people who were on the tenure and promotion committee are the chair people, and uh, one of the deans, uh, Dean Brandris, Marion Brandris and Mary Jones, who uh, was head of student activities, were on the tenure and promotion committee. They were administration and they became good friends of mine. And when my name came up for tenure, uh, two years after I arrived, uh, they told me not to worry. No matter what Ernie did, I was going to get tenure. Because they knew who I was. They, they had recognized who I was. And uh, indeed, I did get tenure. And indeed, I und as I understood it, Ernie did not oppose me, uh, my, my, my tenure, although I was giving him a very hard time. He, uh, Webb Booty and a lot of people in, who are old-timers will remember all the screaming matches that occurred in, in, uh, in that first building, in, in that C building, when it went up, and I forget when, at the end of the 50s, when, when the first building went up. It, it, it was a very what hard time. What was on the block before? Uh, b uh, loft, loft buildings, and uh, you know they w they were knocked down, and the C building went up, and uh, there was the cafeteria. You know everything was, it was in that. It was built as specifically as an FIT building. Right, that was the first the first building that went up, and we had a big ceremony and all. And uh, after Bethel, it was Larry Jarvey who came in, and it was, uh, it was Larry, uh, in Larry Javi's uh, administration that the union was born. And uh, one, of the th one of the things I'm very proud of is that when I was chairman of the union, I was still elected to the executive board of the union all the time. And when I retired and became an adjunct, I retired from the chairmanship, and the adjuncts asked me to represent them on the executive board of the union, which made me feel very good. And uh, but of course, after one semester, I realized I wasn't there often enough, and it wouldn't be right. And it should be someone who was there you know, three, four days a week. There, there's uh, just so much to tell, you know. Uh, I, I not only, you know, after I had run the newspaper for several years, I ran the yearbook for several years, I, I was elected to almost every faculty committee there was. I was uh, the faculty person on the edu uh, Educational Foundation. Uh, 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 I was the, uh, I don't know, there's just some, I was on almost every, every committee that, that was created by the uh, a faculty association after I stepped down as chairman, and uh, was elected several times to the executive board of the uh, faculty association, and almost constantly in the uh, to the uh, uh, executive committee of the union all the time. And uh, the union has been a very important uh, part of uh, my life, and uh, at, at at FIT. And that was much of what I had to say uh, when I made that speech at the Harrison Conference Center to the new people, telling them about that. What, what was the Harrison Conference Center? People who had been at FIT, I think, 10 years, were asked to meet under uh, Marvin Feldman, who, uh, uh, when Marvin Feldman came, he instituted all kinds of uh, uh, en encounter, you know, that, that was the time when encounters were big, Phil Milio started then. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, we used to go to encounter sessions upstate. Shirley Goodman came once, and Marvin came several times. What do you times. mean by encounter sessions? Uh, uh, where oh, uh, this was big, uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, where uh, people would uh, meet in groups. We 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 would play all kinds of psychological games. 
there became an analysis of behavior. The whole idea was that faculty should get along better with one another and with students and to become more sensitized to students and student problems. And because in those days, each faculty member had a load of 20 or 30 students to be an advisor to, a counselor. And, uh, and of course, FIT kept growing, and uh, every year people would go away on encounter, you know, upstate. And, but this was a conference center which was not an, uh, that kind of psychological thing, but uh, an, uh, to orient faculty to uh, uh, all of the needs of students and, and what FIT really was about. Should I stop now? Or? Uh, no, I think I'll right. continue. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, you'll tell me when to stop. Yeah. Uh, so I made this speech about, uh, you know, to f people who had been there ten years. I was representing. I had been what asked. Year was this? What ten? Uh, uh, this was about ten years ago. I think this was '84 or '85, and uh, Marvin Feldman was there. And I told this whole story of Ernie, who he detested, because Marvin Feldman uh, was left high and dry by him. And I had a very close relationship with Marvin Feldman. And, uh, uh, and you know, Marvin Feldman, as a president, had his faults, but he was totally devoted to FIT and uh, did a lot of wonderful things. Uh, you know, he came from West Point and uh, we educated him. He began to understand what FIT did was, and I think he was a uh, extraordinary. What do you mean you educated him? As to what FIT was, what its mission was, what, and the fact that there were so many gay kids, and he had come from West Point, uh, that was always something that we did. You know, the management kids, the kids in the Department of Management, always would come in very macho and very uh, uh, involved with, you know, with the industry and, uh, you know, their feelings about gay kids were maybe what's returning to America today or has never left. And uh, M Marvin uh, 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 really learned very, very quickly wh what FIT was about and devoted himself wholeheartedly to uh, the development of FIT. I know that Marvin had his differences with Shirley, but both of them were giants in the earth in those days. As a matter of fact, one of the sad things about FIT now is that the people who were the shakers and, and the makers and the giants met, uh, have either died or retired. I mean, there, you know, there are a few left, but the people who really built FIT and uh, Newt Godnick was one of them, by the way, and uh, we had, you know, I, I knew Newt very well, and, you know, we, we liked each other very much, and as a matter of fact, of course, I was at his retirement party, and, and uh, you know, we've written to each other, but I haven't seen him either in the last few years. But he was another one who was a, a workaholic. We were all workaholics. I mean, I'd leave in the morning five days a week, and I wouldn't get home until dinner time. And How many classes did you teach? We started, we started teaching five classes. Uh, in, 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 in the uh, uh, career areas, it was 18 hours. In the academic areas, it was 15 hours. The union brought it down to 12 hours with the, co you know, with the contract. And uh, you see, the career areas were teaching three hours more. And of course, the result of the union was that the, uh, the, the uh, liberal arts people got much closer to the vocational people. Of course, when I started, I knew every faculty member. There were maybe 20 of us, or 23. Uh, but, you know, as we grew larger, uh, it became hard to know everybody, but I knew all the early people in every division. Because since I served on, on almost all the committees, in, uh, in the faculty association, uh, I got to know everybody who, you know, who was a a shaker or a maker at FIT, and 
I was very proud to consider myself one of them. And uh, how did the students change? What were the students like in the early stages? <sighs> uh, they well, they were never great academic uh, uh, scholars, and uh, but they were really very fine in terms of their uh, career abilities, and but they never did. Uh, tremendously well on scholastic aptitude tests. But my feeling was, uh, when I came to FIT, uh, and I had come from a family where my father was a presser, an immigrant, and I would never have gone to college if I'd had to pay, and I went to Brooklyn College free, and, you know, and I, I realized that what I had to do for these kids is teach them what uh, humanities was about you know, what literature was about uh, and how it related to their lives. And this was my whole mission always. And I think I succeeded. I have a whole you know, thing that I say that I couldn't throw away, you know, from kids and, you know, and supervisors and all of them. But I felt that it is not a big trick to teach at Harvard or Yale. It's a big trick to teach well at FIT and to have kids get excited about what you're doing. Most of them were the first generation who went to college? Many, yes, yes, as a matter of fact. Many of these kids were coming uh, for the first, you know, uh, uh, would not have had an opportunity except that they had this ability. Uh, first was the apparel people, then merchandising. And, uh, you know, that those were the first two large divisions, and then, of course, a lot of other areas were created. And uh, I was there through this whole period that it was growing, you know, and I watched this, this whole thing happen. And thinking sociologically, if you would, for a minute, how would you describe their ethnic background, the socioeconomic status, the gender, their age? How would you describe those students and the changes? Well, the many of them seem to be uh, uh, kids of, well, we had a great many kids from, uh, from uh, the surrounding metropolitan area. And uh, none of them were great students, you know, but they had a lot of ability in, in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, creative imagination. And, you know, you, you, it was something to build on, even in the liberal arts. Uh, were they mostly Italian, Jewish? From the metropolitan area, a lot of Jewish kids who uh, maybe would not have made it at, at, at fine uh, liberal arts schools but uh, were able to make it uh, at FIT. And it, not because we lowered standards, but because we, uh, we worked them hard and you know, we, we made them adhere to a, a kind of, uh, um, we, we, we instilled in them a kind of pride about you know, their background and about, uh, 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 I introduced the first literature course I uh, created a, a course called Key Ideas in Literature, which started with the ancient Greeks and went up to the 20th century with, with Oedipus and Camus and, not, and, and the, the great Russian writers. I did not patronize them one bit. What I mean is I gave them the toughest stuff and told them that's what it was going to be, and I expected them. They loved it. Or maybe they loved me, I don't know. But they read, and I, I would do as much as eight books, in a, in a, in a, and never a piece of anything. When when I assigned a book, it was a whole book. Of course, not uh, War and Peace or the Brothers Karamazov, but you know stuff that they could handle. Camus, uh, uh, Fathers and Sons, you know, the great great literature, uh, that, and that was the first literature course in the English department, and then uh, others were created. Uh, and of course, other people followed me and uh, into the English department. And... Uh, what about the speech department? That was there from the beginning? The there department? was no speech department. Oh. The speech department was, was created under my aegis as chairman. Mm -hmm. What happened was, uh, there was, the, you know, speech was required. What was speech? Public speaking? Yes. In other words, making speeches, and you know, and and uh, uh, there would be seven or eight uh, speeches. There were six credits in English that were required to satisfy the state university. One, one was a writing course, the composition, three credits. 
uh, and the other was three credits in, in public speaking. That was it. There were no literature courses, there were certainly no electives, there was nothing, just those two. We, didn't, we now have a catalog full of so many courses, you know, which have been since created. And, and the students in the beginning were mostly from the metropolitan area. Uh, well, and, and Middle West. They came from Mi the Middle and West? Middle West, yes, we had students coming from the Middle West. And, uh, and many of them because they were interested in design, in the design areas or in, in uh, merchandising. And uh, they had to take some kind of an entrance test and certainly show a portfolio of some sort of, of, of their work. And uh, I think maybe they were better maybe in, in terms of their abilities than the kids we're getting now because with, with all the economic problems and financial problems we have, I think Kid, you know, we have to get a population, uh, and I think there's people perhaps are not looking as carefully anymore in their ability, even in the career areas, which is one of the things that troubles me about what's happening at FIT now. But um, my my feeling is, however, that these kids still need to be given a sense of pride. And whatever is taught them in the liberal arts has to be relevant to their lives. And my task always has been to show them that either their writing or the literature or the speaking, whatever, is related to their lives and how they're going to use it. What changes have you seen in terms of students today? You know, if you think, when, was the, when did you teach full-time? When did you let I stopped full teaching full-time in 85. Okay, compared to 85, let's see. Have, did you notice changes in the students? I, I, think, I think there is a kind of uh, uh, lack of, of, of excitement about education, which, which uh, they used to be. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, uh, maybe the quality of teaching is, is not what it used to be, uh, because people are discouraged. Uh, it, I, I think maybe the, the, the typical FIT student no longer has a kind of excitement about uh, the, liberal, the liberal arts. And uh, I find that sad. Uh, I have stopped teaching now. You know, I, I haven't been teaching this semester, and. Uh, and this is for the record, I don't think I'll be teaching again because actually when I left it was almost 50, it was 50 years of teaching for me, including the 12 years I had in high school. And I think that's quite enough. And I also wanted to do some other things with my life and, you know, other, uh, I had some other interests. And uh, so... Uh, you want to discuss your other interests? Sure. <laughs> One of the things I'm doing uh, that I've become very interested in is uh, uh, taking Yiddish courses at the senior center, and uh, Emma Zoller, uh, who, who's a wonderful teacher, she's already in her seventies, I think, but I'm, we've known her for ten years. She's been doing this, uh, and uh, she teaches a course in Yiddish culture and then one in Yiddish language. And since uh, Yiddish was my first language, I started elementary school unable to speak a word of English. And uh, I, because it had been spoken at home, and my father was a presser and really didn't read, and they, they really didn't even want me to go to college. I had to fight my way through my, it was not a typical Jewish family, you know. And none of my mishpacha uh, ever. None of your relatives? Yes. None of my relatives uh, ever went to college. And, uh, uh, so I had to fight my way to go to Brooklyn College, and uh, I, I did. And I, I got there, and it opened up a world to me. But uh, then, I, of course, I began to forget uh, Yiddish. I mean, I was involved with English and French, which we, uh, my wife and I, both fluent in. And, uh, and then 
something happened. I don't, I don't know what, but I became very excited about reclaiming it, and I went back. And I've been very excited about reading the literature in Yiddish, which uh, I really had known only in translation. The poets, the short story writers, the novelists, who are absolutely miraculous. And hearing, hearing Shalom Aleichem in, in, in Yiddish was, uh, for me, a really mystical, wonderful experience, hearing him in Yiddish. And uh, I began to read as painfully as I could. I could do some reading because I'd had a bar mitzvah, you know, and I, <laughs> and I had, uh, uh, I, you know, and after that, that was the end. But I was able to read, at least I knew the Hebrew alphabet. And I started to read Yiddish poets uh, with great difficulty, but I did. And then uh, uh, Emma gave us a book you know, the second course, for those of us who read, uh, and even haltingly and painfully, Parrots, and I read a Parrots short story uh, and realized how magnificent it was. It took me uh, as long to read a Parrots short story as a long novel, you know, it was very, very painful. But now one of the things I'm very excited about, especially after the summer of being at the Yiddish camp, uh, we're going to be going to Kles camp up in the Catskills. I don't know if you would know what class camp is. This, we're going to be going in, uh, you know, at the end of December. And, uh, and I, but I, I really want to learn to write Yiddish. I'm even contemplating the possibility that I may live long enough to write poetry in Yiddish. I don't know. But, uh, but I don't, you know, my writing is very, very poor. And my reading is halting, but um, it's getting better and yeah, better. Yeah, I've been writing poetry in English. Uh, yes, yes, and publishing a lot in periodicals and now uh, that's the other. That's you write the, short stories. Too? No, Lala does. Uh, she yeah. she does fiction. I don't, and she she does poetry and teaches it. I don't teach poetry. Did many people at FIT do their own writing in the English department? Yes, uh, there are uh, two people who are scholars: uh, uh, Miriam Gogol and Florian Stuber. Really, are uh, uh, both hired by me. And uh, as a matter of fact, Florian Stuber took over my full-time slot. You know Florian. And uh, they, uh, they are both uh, really scholars. Uh, Florian is an 18th century scholar, and, and Miriam is a, an American a literature scholar. Uh, I won't tell you my opinion about a lot of other people in the English department, but those are two who are extraordinary and also good teachers. Well, as a chair, what did you look for in people? What was important in terms of what was, the English department? What was terribly important to me was that teachers should be creative, imaginative, and relate to their students, and uh, not this uh, uh, distant thing uh, that someone who considered himself or herself a scholar uh, should look down their noses at our students. I felt that there was very often a kind of patronizing, uh, uh, you know, giving people uh, grades uh, that they did not earn and uh, uh, telling them that something was good when it wasn't, that they had to know what was good and what was not. And when they realized that you were sincere and that you meant it for, their, for them, they, they came around. I mean, I, my standards were always tremendously high, and yet I knew uh, that my students loved me. I mean, and I wasn't kidding myself. I knew that. I have a lot of notes upstairs, too, which I couldn't throw away. But uh, this is what I wanted, and uh, in some cases I saw it. And of course, I did a lot of observation uh, of, of, of faculty, and How long were you chair? Uh, about seven years. The uh, chair is uh, rotated? Or uh, no, uh, there's an election. Of course, you know, the union made that an elective position before it had been an appointed position. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to tell about that, you know, very political. As a matter of fact, before I took over, uh, you can ask other people in the English department, people were killing each other in the English department. It was famous throughout the college for murderous internecine uh, uh, warfare, also in the uh, fashion design department. And uh, then they wanted me uh, 
to be chairman, and I really didn't want to do it. I was already a full professor, and I said, get lost. I mean, I don't need this agony. What do I need it? And uh, at one point, what happened was uh, the department got up a petition I didn't even know and signed their names asking me to be chairman. They sent it to Lila, and Lila came to me. She said, are Lila, you your wife? Yes, and my wife. And Lila said, are you telling people I don't want you to be chairman? I I didn't even know what was happening. They had sent, they had all signed their names, all these warring factions asking me to be chairman. And uh, finally I consented, and of course, it's a murderous job. And, but for the first time, that department began to work together. And Gil Shea, whom I had not spoken to for many, many years, came to me one day and said, you know it's time for this department to uh, be recogni uh, for, uh, to recognize the speech people and to make it an English and speech department. And I said, Gil, you're right, and I'm going to work for it. And I did. And uh, it was under my aegis, it became the Department of English and Speech. And speech is still primarily public speeches? No, speeches. there are now many electives. Group discussion, uh, I forget, you know, the catalog has a whole bunch of speech. Oh, yeah, there are many speech electives that have, that have since come in. And, uh, of course, lots of literature electives. Uh, electives in every area, just like Webb has, uh, you know, War and Peace and all of that. And in sociology, you have a lot of electives. And... Uh, Why was there such uh, interesting fighting? About promotion, about observation, about... Uh, 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 working on committees, I tried to get ev you know everybody. It, it, it became a diplomatic uh, uh, business. You know they they were just killing each other, and there were some people who just were not willing to do anything, and they thought they ought to be promoted, and uh, you know the department would vote on it, and uh, you know and they wouldn't be highly recommended, and or the department would recommend them, and then the college-wide committee would throw them out, you know, and, and uh, 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 there was a lot of political, just as there is in every college or university. Could and you trace the changes in terms of promotion from the early stages? I think it was first selected by the chairperson? Yes. Well, uh, early on, it was frequently favorites, you know, who, who got uh, 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 promoted. Uh, at the time that I was, uh, uh, when the professorship was instituted, and that was, I, I really didn't care about that. I, it became a, a salary uh, uh, step, you know, that's why when the state university instituted assistant associate and full professor, uh, uh, yes, it was very uh, prestigious, but uh, I, I always said, uh, give me the money, I don't, I don't care about the title. and. Uh, but of course, then the union brought in this business of, if 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 uh, you know if you if you came as an instructor, you could go up the salary step to assistant professor to, you know to it, to uh, the uh, top step of assistant professor, and salaries of course kept you know with each contract kept improving. I don't think that's going to happen anymore. But. Uh, uh, Everybody was an instructor when they came uh, No, uh, yes, except uh, those of us who were senior came in as, uh, uh, since I was one of the uh, grandfathers, I was made associate professor uh, and, uh, because of the salary step, you see. Uh, not, not for any other reason, not for merit or anything else, but the salary step was associate professor. And then, uh, of course, I, uh, at the time I was running around trying to get uh, the union in, I was up for promotion for, to full, and I was worried it wasn't going to happen, but it did. Was there ever a time when it was automatically that you became full professor? No. As a matter of fact, uh, there were those of us who felt that that should happen, that there should be automatic steps up to uh, the top. I think I have since changed my mind about that. I think, uh, you know, I have seen uh, that because of political considerations, there have been some incompetent people who have gotten tenure, 
and for them to work to go up to a full professor would be an outrageous scandal. And uh, uh, but at one point, you know, the union's position, and maybe still is now, you know, all my close friends who are still there, Judy and Lou and Judy Wood and other people, Joe. Uh, that it, it, it wouldn't, you know, I don't, I don't want to see certain people promoted. I mean, there are one or two people who are, assistant, who are assistant professors in the English department who've been there a long time. If it had been up to me, if I could have arranged some way to get rid of them, I would have as, as, as a chairman. Uh, there were times I wanted to say, take your stuff and get the hell out of here, uh, please. Don't, don't come back, but <laughs> couldn't do that. And uh, they, they were people whom I was constantly being tactful with. Uh, you know, I'd get complaints from students and I'd call them in and say, could you explain to me what your system is, what are you doing, and they'd explain and I'd say, I'm afraid I don't understand what you're telling me. I, I, I suppose I ought to be careful not mention names, but uh, they were people who, after I retired, and you know, I, the whole department was working together at that at that time, but when I retired, uh, there were two or three people who came over to me and I said, please, I don't have to talk to you anymore. Do not even greet me. I don't want to see your face. And they were astounded because, you know, I, when I had been chairman, it always had been very tactful and diplomatic. I said, I really don't have to deal with you anymore. Please get out of my sight. And. Uh, which was kind of nasty, I suppose, but that's the way I felt. And uh, they had made my life such a misery. And one reason I retired was to get out of the championship. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I, I just felt I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I was keeping me up nights, you know, the, the problems and, 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 and the unprofessionalism. And, uh, about... Uh, Maybe 15, 15 or 20 years ago, I, I started uh, writing poetry again. I had written some in college, but you know, didn't amount to anything. And I uh, became very in involved with that. But and, you know, and I wanted more time to devote myself to that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that uh, uh, when my uh, family uh, situation allows. Have you noticed it, uh, changes in terms of relationships with industry from the liberal, from the English department perspective, um, administration? Well, administration you discussed to some extent. But well, there well, was a big battle. Uh, the, the liberal industry. arts, of course, was a kind of tail on on, on the dog, and uh, you know it, uh, the liberal arts was not held in great. Esteem, and it was Gladys Marcus really who who fought that battle very well, and uh, and Marvin Feldman, who had come from uh, uh, Washington at one point, was a vocational man, you know, who 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 was in, uh, involved with career education, did begin to understand, and he always said he valued uh, uh, the humanities. But we made him uh, uh, give more recognition to it, and, and, and you know, uh, and uh, even the language he used about it, you know, was you know, in terms of uh, uh, nomenclature for uh, areas in, in, in the, uh, the humanities, uh, and we had to fight that battle uphill all the time for for, for the humanity, you know, for the liberal arts areas to uh, to come into uh, its own. And, uh, and, and and Gladys fought that battle. Uh, did you have any connection with people in the apparel industry and manufacturing? Uh, no, except that, no, not really. I mean, we were uh, a liberal arts, a liberal arts faculty who were, uh, uh, we felt that the students should get a real liberal arts foundation in all the areas, in science, and math, and sociology and English and so on. We felt that uh, they, they should have that and the, the understanding was that it was important that someone who was a graduate of FIT sitting down with people 
uh, from other areas in the industry uh, should be able to talk about stuff other than their uh, 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 design interests, that they should know what went on in the world and uh, should know, have some grounding in, in, in literature, in, in the arts, in sociology or whatever. It, uh, I mean, after all, that is, is, is what our mission should be. Uh, uh, it was terribly important that, that our students should be like other college uh, graduates. So, it, 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 you know, we were not, we were determined not to become an adjunct to the career areas, but, the, but to be a very independent and, uh, to be a very independent and uh, uh, forceful uh, influence to, uh, for uh, culture and, uh, and also uh, a second thing, I mean, I can't think of all these things right now that these people were going to graduate and be citizens of a country which was a democracy and that they had certain obligations as uh, uh, citizens of a democracy to know what we were all about as a country and therefore we had to do this as a, uh, uh, as a college. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about that in committees, you know, and at, at conferences and so on about, you know, what, what, what is our mission? What should we be doing? We were forever defining our mission. And Marion Brandris, who was the dean, I, I don't know if that's a name familiar to you. She was, she was a, a dean of students uh, from the beginning. Marion died uh, several years ago. And Mary Jones, uh, who was head of student activities, started, and this will interest you, Audrey will remember it, that uh, she, Mary Jones instituted uh, a, uh, a requirement for graduation of community service, that no student would be allowed to graduate who was not doing a year. When uh, was this instituted? When? Audrey may remember that, but it's got to go back 25, 25 years. I know, it, you know, from, the, from almost the very beginning. Mary Jones and Marion Brandris had also come, I think, from Fashion Industries High School, but they were extraordinary people. Like Rosalind Snyder, they were first rate. And Marion Brandris was Dean of Students, except, and now I'll you know, on the, on the light side, of course, there were requirements for dress codes at the beginning, and uh, uh, students were not allowed to come in slacks, and they were not allowed to come in socks, and uh, of course, Marion, who loved me and I loved her, had some terrible battles. Uh, when she, you know, she'd see a student come into my class in socks or somewhere else, you know, and, and, or a student would come in with purple hair. I didn't care what they came in. Uh, and uh, Marion would come and say, I want that student. I said, Marion, you can't have her. I'm not letting her out of my class. And, and you know, Marion would say, she's wearing socks. I said, Marion, I don't give a damn. You know, Marion, I'm teaching her. I want, she's remaining in my class. And, <laughs> and I, I, I'd have a fight with Marion, but we really were very close. We loved each other. What about dress clothes for faculty? At first, we uh, many of us were in shirts and ties, but if you look around, you and see jackets. The, and jackets. But very soon that very soon that disappeared, and uh, uh, you look at the design, the fashion design people. You know, they <laughs> uh, sometimes they're in shirts and ties, and sometimes they look very sloppy. Bill Blass or Jeffrey Bean, these great great geniuses, who uh, you know come in very often not with ties. I mean, they come in and not all dressed up. Or Calvin Klein, or whoever. Are they, are they graduates? Yes. All no, three? no. Yeah, Calvin Klein is. I don't. I don't think Jeffrey Bean and, uh, uh, is. Or Bill Blass. Uh, but uh, Calvin Klein is a graduate of FIT. He was there. Do you there. remember some students who went mm -hmm. on to be famous or very uh, successful? Well, I did not teach Calvin Klein. No, he was not in my composition class. 
uh, and uh, but I, I've seen him address uh, graduates. You know, he's been invited when we've had uh, graduations at Radio City, and uh, th there were one or two students. One in particular, Vince, I forget his last name now, who became one of the most extraordinary illustrators in, 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 in American design, whom I failed because he just didn't cut the class. <laughs> not because, I mean, you know, he just absented himself because he just was not interested. And I could not, I, I knew how gifted he was, but, uh, uh, but he, uh, he was a very nice fellow, but he just, you know, he was uh, he, he just didn't come to class very much, and when he came, he didn't do anything, and I had to give him an F. And uh, he is one of the most extraordinary people who attended FIT. And about ten years ago, he died of AIDS. And uh, I don't know if he ever resented. I, I once talked with him, and he said he did not resent it. He was so famous, he <laughs> didn't have to resent it. I mean, you know, he was, you know, but he graduated FIT? No, he, he didn't graduate, but he went to FIT. Yeah, he went to FIT. He was in my composition class. And, you know, and, uh, and I talked with him, and I told him I would not be able to pass him, and he really didn't care. But he was a very extraordinary uh, illustrator. And uh, uh, the galleries at FIT have had a show, a show or two shows of his things, and uh, his stuff was always appearing in the outstanding magazines and newspapers around the country, uh, but as I say, he died ten years ago. When you think of the early history, do you know who founded FIT and what the story? Yes, as a matter of fact, there, there are stories there to be told. You see, I told you early on about uh, Ernie Fleischer, you know, they, they tapped a lot of the people from Central Needle Trades High School. As a matter of fact, how did I get to FIT? The, the fellow who was doing the scheduling for FIT was a, uh, a, a history teacher at Central Needle Trades High School. Sid Margulis was his name. He had been my high school teacher. And uh, I was then teaching English uh, at New Utrecht High School in, in uh, Brooklyn. And one day, uh, and every young kipper, we used to go to, uh, uh, to Sid Margulis' house in Brooklyn uh, we had remained friends from, from the time I was his student, and uh, we would go to his house every Yom Kippur Eve and break the fast, start, and break the fast. And, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, we knew, I knew, and Lauren and I knew, that he was at Central Lincoln Craig's High School and doing the scheduling. And one day, Sid called up and said, Dave, I want you to teach in the continue in the evening at FIT. I said, I don't want an evening job. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in making money. He said, Dave, you heard me. I said you get an evening job. Because that place it has a tremendous future and it will make your future. That's the kind of guy that Sid Marvelous was. I said, Sid, I really you know, I really I really don't feel like teaching. He said, You're gonna do it, he said, and you're gonna thank me for it. That was in in 56 when I took the evening job at FIT. They had a continuing ed program right from the beginning? Yes, from the very beginning. That's where I started in 56. I don't know whether from 44, but when I got there in 56, yeah, that, yeah it was a, a going, a going. I, I taught a section in, uh, in, in composition in, the, uh, uh, in 56. Yeah. I just heard that uh, continuing ed is going to be merged with the day or something. I, so they're doing something there. That's. And you got Who three. Were the students from there? Uh, in the evening, uh, there were people who didn't have to take this class aptitude, you know, and a lot of them dropped out. I mean, they would come in they the. They worked evening. in the industry, right? Apparel industry. Right, in the apparel industry. Immigrant kids, immigrant people? Immigrant, yes, a lot of immigrant people, Puerto Rican. Uh, and uh, many of them were pattern making, you know. Puerto Rico. Uh, and yeah, and uh, and and uh, th th but they had to take English, and of course, of course, many of them were terrible in terms of English, but uh, they were many of them immigrants and so on. From Puerto Rico, what other countries? Uh, other places in South America, from uh, Black Americans too. South Americans. Uh, where else? Not as many Asians then. 
you know, the, the, the whole Asian influx, as I, as I said the other day in Flushing, as I've said to friends, the Asians are taking over America, thank God. Uh, I said, that's what's going to save New York, the Asians. And uh, so, uh, so I, I did that, and of course, it turned out to be right. And then about 10, about 15 years ago, Sid died of a sudden heart attack. But I, I, I was starting to get something else. You would ask me... About the early founding of the founding Yes, of yes, yes, yes. Well, in the early days, that faculty was so small. Well, it had been founded, of course, by a group of uh, industry people, Morris Haft, after whom the editor, uh, auditorium was named you know, well-to-do design. There had been this pressure to create a college, which was different. You know, a lot of people have always have always confused fashion industries, high school, and fashion institute of technology. The truth is, by the way, we never took many students from fashion industries, high school, from central needle trades. We took their best. And uh, we took their best, you know. And uh, some of them were just really not able to do the liberal arts part of it, although they were, you know, uh, uh, talented. And it used to be that kids would have would leave because, you know, they 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 had failed, uh, and y you know, they and if they failed again. They were put out, you know, uh, you know, when they reached a certain uh, average. So Mars Haft. Mars Haft. And uh, uh, other people, uh, uh, Deutsch or Deutsch, who was another very important, uh, as a matter of fact, he served as an interim president once after Bethel died. Uh, uh, Deutsch or Deutsch, I forget. Uh, the, the, and, and, you know, there was a board from labor and, and from uh, industry. Industries, what industries do you remember? Yeah, the fashion, and uh, you know, the uh, dress industry and, uh, uh, and the men's clothing industry, and I, that's, which is where I think Stolberg came from. And uh, Morris Haft had a mansion out in Connecticut, and every Thanksgiving he would invite the faculty uh, to come out and have a feast for a whole day uh, with the most lavish foods and you know it was a day where uh, we all got together you know from all the areas but there were then 30 of us you know or, or maybe 40 of us and Morris Half would stand in a big chef's hat and dish out food and uh, you know we all went to Connecticut because they kept insisting on something that we were a family, that this faculty was a family. And I remember making fun of that. So then we would always have these marvelous uh, affairs. And, you know, we always make, you know, and Shirley Goodman and Morris Half would say, you, you are a family, we are a family. And we'd say, yeah, yeah, you are. yeah, we're a family. And then, by the way, I began to feel that we were. I mean, it was something, you know, I learned some things myself, that indeed we were a family. Uh, Morris Hef, was he a college graduate? No. Not he at all. He was an Eastern European uh, yes. immigrant? Yes, yes. Who had made it rich, you know, in, in the dress industry. And they went up, uh, you know, one, I, I forget the whole history of this, you'll get this from other people maybe, upstate, and, and plan, they made this plan for founding this college. In you 44, uh, yeah, they, you know that it should be in Manhattan, oh. but but they met upstate, you know, and they and, and invited these very rich people who were giving a lot of money, and to create an educational foundation uh, to provide scholarship funds for uh, students who who couldn't afford the uh, tuition because there there was tuition very nominal then, and uh, why do you think they started the college? Why did they start the college? They felt that uh, a high school devoted to this was not enough. They felt they wanted to have people who had a cultural background, who, who uh, uh, had a, 
uh, something besides just careers, uh, people who would be, you know, there was already Parsons. Uh, there was no, I don't, don't believe there was a degree granting fashion institution, you know? And then there was a lot of talk about the ridiculousness of the name, Fashion Institute of Technology. I remember in my time there were some efforts to change the name of the college and then they gave it up because it doesn't mean anything. Fashion Institute of Technology. And at one point there was a big campaign and then those of us who were more thoughtful said, look, that's how we're known. Keep it. <laughs> Even though it doesn't mean anything. You know, these people up there, you know, many of them immigrants say, hey, MIT listen to MIT, we're going to be FIT, even though it didn't mean anything. So people wanted to, I remember, uh, you know, there was big pressure to change the name of the college. And uh, and then some of us thought better of it and said, ridiculous, why are you going to change the name of the college? I mean, you know, I mean we're known as FIT and we, we're known all over the world and indeed we are. Do, uh, did you see a change in terms of international programs? The, the yes, as a matter of fact, there was. Gladys instituted an international program, and then there was a place in, in Israel, you know, and then in Florence, in Italy, and then in South, I think in South America, and uh, uh, there were, you know, and then we, by the way, we, we would send students abroad you know, for a uh, summer, uh, or... Uh, Got college credit for it, you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, and, and these fashion institutions abroad. But we also got, st we started getting a lot of students from abroad, you know. I remember, you know, I had students from Germany who came. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, ten, you know, 12 years or more ago, I had several students in my, uh, my American literature class because by then there was a, we were teaching American literature <laughs> and I, I started to teach American literature and uh, of course on the whole the students we got from Europe were sad to relate much better than the kids we were getting from here I mean you know in my American lit class there were kids who couldn't cope with it but my kids who came from Hamburg and, uh, and, and Munich I had to give A's to them. oh wonderful <laughs> well what how do you explain that because there is a different attitude towards education in Europe. I was just talking with this, about this with Carol. You know, I have a very close friend. Carol Reams, I don't know if you care. Carol Reams is also an adjunct, uh, now a retiree. She retired two years after me. And Carol lives at Penn Station South across the street. And my closest friend in the department is, is Carol. And uh, she's my age, and uh, you, we've been very close over the years. And she retired, she had a party. I was one of the last, and Carol, next to last person, who had a big, big faculty party. About 300 people came. Yeah. They gave me a wonderful piece of luggage that I've used a lot, you know, from Mark Cross. They, and they also gave me uh, truffles, uh, Swiss chalk, because I'm a chocoholic and they all know it. And so they gave me a whole, like, yeah, it, it was a, one of the loveliest parties. Gladys spoke, Marvin Feldman spoke, and it was a whole. Now they have a faculty party for every, you know, everybody. They very rarely are. Newt Godnick had a big party, which he richly deserved. Newt Godnick was just a splendid uh, person. I mean, he was one of the people who really built, he's one of the giants. And, uh, but when he stopped, he stopped. His wife also said she was going to divorce him because his whole life was, <laughs> FIT. But, uh, and Jeanette Jarno, I don't know if you know Jeanette, founded the merchandising department, just like Bill founded the science department, Bill Leader, who we were supposed to go to last week, but it was canceled. Uh, because Bill Leader, you know, I've, I've can't, some of these people have remained my friends, uh, you know. Bill Leader still comes in and teaches a course in science, you know. He's, he's had heart attacks dead already, revived. You know. Several of the other people have died already, you know, retirees. Uh, when you think about, uh, you know, if we could close up on the interview, something you want to go into the archives, you think really should be part of FIT history? 
mostly what I've been talking about, that it is a unique, singular institution uh, in, in, in that we emphasize that people in career areas, and after all, fashion is maybe the major industry in New York City, but if someone gets out of FIT, that person, we hope, is also equipped to be a sophisticated citizen, is also equipped to talk about cultural things, and that is the whole idea. Speaking as a, a liberal arts person, uh, with great sympathy for the uh, uh, career areas, and my feeling, by the way, also odd, oddly enough, that I had come to FIT and my father had been a presser in the dress industry. And this was a, a sort of an ironic, wonderful thing that his son had, had, had come to be uh, one of the uh, uh, original people. Not really original. I mean, I didn't come in 44. I came 56, but when, before any of the buildings went up on 27th Street. Those buildings were built for FIT. The lofts Absolutely. were oh, uh, torn all, at, down. All the, right, the, the lofts were torn down, yeah. And, and then the dorms went up, you know, and Marvin Feldman had a lot to do with that, too. You know, Marvin Feldman did a lot of the building, you know, uh, and he, he was very, very devoted to it. I don't know that the present president can understand, you know, what went into this. I mean, I, I met him once very briefly. And then, of course, Gladys died, and Shirley died, Marion died, Mary died. And, uh, it's, it's been hard, and a lot of uh, wonderful people. Hilda, uh, as a matter of fact, several of the important, like Hilda Jaffe, who was dean of the design areas, was my student in my literature class. I mean, there were people. Joe, who was the treasurer of. Uh, uh, Joe Garofalo? Joe Garofalo was in my class. In my all FIT students. Yeah. Performance. Yeah. In other words, and he, he took, you know, he was getting a degree at FIT. Well, Jeff Buckman, did he go to FIT? No, I think Jeff Buckman did not. Alan uh, Fishman, did he go to? Al, no, Alan Fishman was Shirley His Goodman's son. Yeah. Uh, son. Uh, no, he went elsewhere. And then, of course, he was head of the uh, Florence, uh, he was. Uh, 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 head of the uh, Florence operation, and uh, I, uh, Alan, Alan, uh, even though his mother was Shirley Goodman, got very active in the union. He became a, one of the important people in the union in the, in, at FIT, and, uh, and Shirley accepted that because she was very smart. Shirley Goodman was a very extraordinary. You know, she started with uh, Grover Whalen, you know, back then. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the Pete Morris half. Was Grover Whelan? He was uh, a fellow who did the Chicago, uh, not the, the New York World's Fair when? In 40, when was the New York World's Fair? I forget. 30s, right? Yes. And she, uh, you know, and when the, when the uh, and sh she did, she didn't even, she came up from the South. I don't even think Shirley Goodman finished college. But when uh, Morris half and, and Deutsch and the other a big shots found at this college. They got hold of Shirley Goodman. They did right. This place would never have been what it was if it weren't for Shirley Goodman. She had political connections. She had connections in the industry, right? And she made them. She she knew what she was about. Uh, I once, uh, you know, uh, I once <laughs> the early days, I I, I I put out a newspaper. And the newspaper proved a lot because I was writing it. And you know, one of the things I objected to was I didn't have a staff, and my chairman was making me lie to Rosalind Snyder to tell her that I had a staff and I was putting it out. He wanted me to hand in, uh, you know, and I wasn't teaching the class I was supposed to. They were becoming my staff. And Ernie Fleischer wanted me to create a curriculum that I was teaching that class. And I said, not on your life. I don't do that. If I'm not teaching it, I'm not going to do it. And he started screaming. And I said, I don't care if you turn over 15 times, I'm not going to do it. And I didn't have tenure then. And uh, I don't know how I, uh, you know, where I found the guts. But anyway, uh, Shirley Goodman, I, once I put out a newspaper and you know, students weren't happy with something and I let them express their opinion editorially. And Shirley Goodman called me in and started 
working me over because I had allowed the students to uh, express some uh, dissatisfaction with something that was going on. And, you know, surely it was a power, you know, very respectful. And very respectfully, I told her I believed there was such a thing as freedom of the press, even for kids. And, you know, we had, you know, we had a big, you know, she wiped the floor with me, and I had to be very careful because she was a god. But, <laughs> and uh, she got over it. But, you know, we, what, what I began to realize was she, she got to know who I was, and she began to respect me, you know. And th th that, that was very gratifying, because everyone wanted Shirley's, uh, you know, respect. And she was a powerful, powerful woman, very imaginative, very bright, but not soft, tough, very tough lady. And, uh, but you know, those of us who were in there as workaholics knew what Shirley was. She indeed was a workaholic herself. And Marvin, when he came, and, and he came after Bethel, who was really nothing. And many people said there wouldn't have been a union if there had been anybody else. You know, Bethel really didn't care what was happening. And he's in this, you know, he's in this picture. You know, there's Bethel. And, uh, the, in 65, we went around with the uh, collective bargaining cards. Some of those people are dead already. And uh, that was, uh, and you know, these are all pictures of the executive board. I'd say some of them are, many of them are gone. But uh, I was all, you know, these were pictures of the executive board one year after another. All right, maybe we can, if you take them to FIT, we could make copies and put them in the uh, Yeah, I suppose you can. You know who has it? Lou Stoller has it. They have okay. it up in the union office. Okay. Uh, the, the, I don't know, I forget what year that was, but, uh, but these were people elected to the executive board. A lot of other pictures have, got, have, have, have been spoiled of, you know, of the uh, executive board. Uh, now, Mildred, of course, was not active in any of these things, you know, in, in terms of the politics. But Mildred brought more money into that college than anybody, as she must have told you. In what way? Uh, uh, grants. Grants. Grant money. Nobody raised as much grant money as Mildred, you know. And uh, Mildred, I, I got very close to, you know, after she came. And... Uh, always kidded her because uh, she was always opposed to foul language and I remember in the, <laughs> the speech at her farewell party I said Mildred is even learning to use four letter words you know and uh, you know was, uh, kidded her a lot I just feel very guilty because I haven't called her recently and, you know you know she she hasn't been well but uh, Carol Reams is, has remained my close close friend I, I see. I talk to her on the phone once or twice a week. We have lunch when I come Monday, because um, she was a very devoted person too. Am I still on tape? Yeah, you're still on tape. Oh, Do you uh, want to add anything, Madam No, uh, no except to say, I would just say that this, when I think back, you know, over my life, this has been, perhaps, you know, teaching has been for me the most meaningful part of my life. And, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, my, my time at FIT, uh, although, you know, there have been ups and downs, has been the most meaningful and, and, and most gratifying part of my life. Uh, what I've done with, uh, uh, with students and uh, what I did uh, with the chairmanship. And I finally got it, uh, which, <laughs> which I didn't want. So, uh, I don't know, there's a lot more to tell, but, you know, I don't know what, uh, uh, I can stop there. I think it's been very, you know, uh, interesting, and I want to thank you very much. All right, thanks, Carol. I mean, I...